Hi, I'm attorney Demetrius Evans of the Evans International Law Firms, and I am bringing you a presentation that is all about the Yeezy frenzy. Um, but before I delve into that, let me just tell you a little bit about our company. We are the Evans International Law Firms or the Teal Firms for Excellence Matters. We've been in business for the past 14 going into 15 years. We're a boutique um, law firm that deals with contracts international laws across all different types of um, organizations and country lines, as well as intellectual property. That's your infringements of copyrights, patents, and trademarks. As a disclaimer, this was actually put together, this uh, presentation is put together just for purposes of um, interest as well as education. Some of the pictures that are used are not my own and I don't think I have any music, but if I have anything else that is, um, it's not, I'm, I'm not saying I have any right to the ownership of it. Okay, so especially these pictures that I have up about the artist formerly known as Kanye West, who is now calling himself Ye or Ye, I believe it's for Yahweh, um, a very controversial uh, just rapper, songwriter, producer turned fashion designer, just very controversial, um, but rising star within, you know, a certain geographical area, mainly the United States, as well as with a generation, I would say millennial up through um, Generation Z, he has made quite an impact. Forbes has covered him. Time called him one of the 100 most influential people in the world right now. So making quite a stir. And of course, he was also married to a Kardashian, Kim Kardashian. They have four beautiful children. And being married to the Kardashians who are very, very popular, that just increased his popularity, I'm sure. Um, uh, on top of that, he was um, pretty friendly. I guess he still is maybe a Republican and went to the White House, did some talking there, um, always wears or, or routinely wears the Make America Great Again hat um, shown here with President Trump, no, um, no foreigner to any controversy himself. This is a copy of the Yeezy boot. Um, and I, I, I use this picture. There are a lot of pictures of the clothing and the, and the shoes, but I use this picture because this really kind of demonstrates his clothing um, aesthetic. So this kind of big and bulky, um, maybe almost looking like a, a, a shoe that is, it's a little bit plastic, right? So we've had the uh, Crocs that we got used to, but this is put, taking it a little bit further, very expensive shoe, not that a Croc is cheap, but a very expensive shoe, but also this non-judgmental, if you will. Um, this is kind of this brownish, this is the, this is the, um, the feel that he brings to clothing and shoes. This is a picture of the clothing you can see it's kind of like it could, you know, it could be like somebody homeless or from another generation uh, if it were in a movie. Um, he has also become famous for covering his face. So uh, you'll see people who are wearing his clothing, they'll cover their face too, or they'll have a lot of hair on their face and it kind of symbolizes almost this following. Uh, but what we want to talk about today is not just him as a person and a controversial um, person in the limelight, light, but we want to talk about contracts and lawsuits. And we want to do that because uh, Ye has split with Adidas and he split with Adidas. This is a, a couple of months back and it's been all the rage, right? But this is because of his licensed trademarks and um, his intellectual property, which allegedly he owns 164 active trademarks designs under the Yeezy brand or the Donda brand or the Yeezus. Um, Adidas was very, very concerned about having him as a part of their brand. And I'm sure that because Adidas has kind of probably gone down a little bit in the ranks, having Kanye or pairing up with Kanye West um, at that point got them what I'm sure is a, a lot of new views from this younger generation. 
Um, so this is a, just a headline I saw. Adidas on Tuesday ended his partnership with Ye. Um, and then an hour later, Gap ended the, the partnership. Foot Locker ended the partnership. Immediately, Foot Locker said they're removing all of the products. Gap shut down the website that was yeezygap.com. And then Adidas came out immediately after Kanye made a tweet that was seen as anti-Semitic. He said it wasn't anti-Semitic, but he, because he's a Hebrew and therefore Jewish, and then he couldn't be um, anti-Semitic. No one has really followed up on that. He's made some comments in the media, but Adidas came out and said, Adidas does not tolerate anti-Semitism or any other sort of hate speech. Uh, given his recent comments, basically we're dropping him, dropping the contract. Now you'll see that this is interesting because it was a multi multi-million dollar contract. Uh, Kanye was set, I think, to be actually a billionaire. It was a billion, a billion dollar, two billion, three billion dollar contract. So for them to just say, oh, he did this and therefore we're dropping him. We don't have to pay. That's interesting in itself. But what has continued to happen is they have now decided, oh, we're going to keep um, using the using the design, but we're not going to put your name on it. So using his, his really his brain Brand without putting the brand name because they said that they own the patent. So it just gets deeper and deeper. Just very, very interesting. Um, so as you can tell, this is all about intellectual property rights in the fashion industry, licensing agreements and associations, because what Adidas and the Gap did is they said, we don't want him as part of our um, organization, any partnerships, any contracts with him, because he is associating in a way that is giving us an ill reputation. So I found this little quote from Richard Branson. He said, your brand name is only as good as your reputation. And so um, companies will then start to figure out more so, you know, recently, how can you protect the reputation of your company or your brand? Um, we're talking about licensing agreement. So I just wanted to just back up and think about some things that have to be in contracts. So it, once you go into a contract, an agreement with somebody about anything, you know you're going to have the who, what, the when, and the where, and the how. So let's say it's just for selling tel telephones. You're going to have who's selling, who they're going to sell it to, exactly what type of phone, where can you sell it, and uh, by what methods can you sell it sell it on the internet, door to door, however you're going to sell it. But then uh, lawyers always want to put in the law and the jurisdiction, because if you don't, then if there's a problem, then you could be using any law or any jurisdiction. And we never want to have that issue. You want to talk about warranties. Uh, what happens if this doesn't, if, if this contract doesn't take place or something happens with the product and then dispute resolutions. I think these, this is, you know, do we want to be in court? Do we want to arbitrate? Betray. These are some of the clauses you always see. However, this clause that talks about reputation um, and what you expect from another company that you're partnering with, you do not always see it because it depends on a set of facts. Now, um, there are also other clauses that you might have in a contract, and they are very uh, specific to what the contract is about. So in this case, um, there was a very serious morals clause, or I believe there was, I have not actually seen the contract, seems to be hidden from public view, but a morality clause within a contract is often used as a means of holding an individual to a certain behavior, behavioral standard, so as not to bring a scandal to the other party. Morality clauses attempt to preserve the public and private image of one of the contracting parties. So I love a little angel angels and devils but if you if you think about this in terms of yay and um, adidas and gap and the other people on, on the on the one side against him it seems that they are saying his behavioral standards uh, there his behavior was so bad it doesn't meet our standards therefore we can um, we can tear up the contract we can nullify it totally and this could be what exactly what the clause said. Um, what's the basis behind these morality clauses? It's deeply rooted in 
deeply rooted in consumer psychology. Um, the idea is that an individual, if they're doing something as an individual that's different than if they come and become part or associated with a, a different company or organization, um, you begin, the public begins to see them as the organization. So you can think about it in terms of an employee that has to wear a uniform, like an officer. Once you see the officer's uniform, he's clothed or she's clothed with um, with the state, right? The power of the state. So you don't necessarily see the individual, but you see the city of Chicago or the state of Illinois, whatever kind of uh, uniform it is. And in the public eye, you are representing that entity. So if we look at Kanye and Adidas, then Kanye would be representing Adidas. So whatever he says um, can, you know, ruin or increase the reputation of Adidas or Gap or anyone else. So reputations are attributable to the company as well as the company's product. Celebrity endorsers carry um, cultural meanings. So you might, um, you might have the status or the value that that individual is bringing to this specific company or its brand. And right there, I just have, you know, everybody wants a thumbs up or a thumbs down, want you to give them a rating, want you to say something good about the company. Um, but, but the consumer is going to do that based on who it's being filtered through. So contract clauses, um, here, here are some sample more morality or morals contract clauses that I found. Here uh, you have a, a university coach and the university says, hey, we can terminate the coach in the following circumstances, situations in which the un un university determines that the best interest, that's what I want you to pay attention to, the best interest of the university in its intercollegiate uh, football program requires um, here's another one. Any conduct of the coach in violation of any criminal statute of moral turpitude. Okay, you might know what that is. I'm not really sure. A serious or intentional violation of any law. You know what serious is, I think. Intentional, you know kind of what that is, um, meaning it wasn't just an accident, but that's going to be up for question and for argument. Um, here's some in the a baseball, baseball player, the club may terminate the contract if the player shall at any time fail, refuse or neglect to conform to his personal conduct to the standards of good citizenship. I'm not sure that anyone really understands what that means. Any good sportsmanship, keep himself in first class condition. Um, here's one for a college employee, any serious act of misconduct. Don't know what that means. Uh, television actor, the actor shall not commit any act or do anything which might bring the actor into public disrepute, contempt, scandal, or ridicule, which might tend to reflect unfavorably on the network. So if this television actor, I don't seemingly does anything the public doesn't like, they can cut the contract because of the mor morals clause. Um, I think we saw this in the case of uh, Kyrie Irving, where Irving um, on his page, uh, put out the, the, not the book, there's a book, but also the movie um, Hebrews to Negroes and didn't even say anything, didn't say anything about Ron Walton or in, anything like that. The person who wrote the book and I'm not sure made the movie, um, but then he was suspended for I think like six games, losing probably millions of dollars. And then it was mandated that he undergo sensitivity training, donate 500,000 to anti-hate causes and meet with the Nets owners. Um, it's my understanding. I don't know if he did all of these things, but he is back playing ball. So his morals clause, um, it kicked in. Even though he didn't say anything, the statement that he made was not out of his mouth, but it was by his actions because he is in the public and therefore whatever he does reflects on uh, the NBA. Uh, I, I really tried to understand as just kind of an aside, everything that's going on, because Kanye seemed to be talking about the Hebrews, and then Kyrie was talking about the Hebrews. So I was trying to understand what 
what's going on with the Hebrews? I went back and read uh, the book of Hebrews. This is a fascinating book. Um, but at some point, the Hebrews in the Bible that we see every Christmas with Moses parting the Red Sea, somehow they turned into the, um, I guess they were the Israelites, Hebrew Israelites, but, but there's a lost tribe of Hebrew Israelites. And then I found a lost tribe of Ethiopian Jews who in 1970 were flown over to the new state of Israel uh, versus the spiritual state of Israel, because I found that too. Then I saw that Kanye West and some other people were saying that uh, Blacks who were brought over to the United States were actually also maybe a tribe, one of the tribe of the lost Hebrew lights. Um, I think these, these cute little girls and that little boy at the top, they were part of the Ethiopian Jews that were forgotten and then flown over to uh, the, the now Israel. And then this is just the H2N, the movie that I guess was released by Kyrie Irving. And then um, there's some other stuff that I found. It just it just is like leads to a rabbit hole. But all of this has to do with the cultural relevance. And I thought that this is this is interesting because what one culture believes is um, is negative, another culture might not believe is negative or is of ill repute. Another culture may not see that the exact same way. Um, I found this case talking about these morality clauses because I wanted to get a sense of how well they do really hold up. And in this case, Knox Pipes versus Genesee's Intermediate School District, the plaintiff argued that because the moral turpitude was not defined. So that's kind of like one of the arguments I would probably have. Hey, you're not really, you're saying moral turpitude, but you're not defining it. Um, there was no legal obligation created. However, the court rejected that argument and said, no, no, if we can actually look up what moral turpitude means uh, in a Black's Law Dictionary, um, this is the law dictionary that lawyers use, if we know what morality means, if we know what conformity to the rules mean, then we can hold, uphold it under the law, which I thought was interesting. Some people do know, but I think what this judge is saying in this case is we're going to look it up and it is what we say it is because we wrote it in a book. Um, here's one from Nader. Nader ABC TV Incorporated. Nader was arrested and he argued that his conduct did not fall within the terms of the morals clause uh, and it was meritless. Nader's arrest generated, however, media attention and his the conduct was um, well beyond, well within the reasonable interpretation of the clause. That was the U.S. Court of Appeals. So they said, yeah, morality clauses have been around for a long time. They're valid and they are enforceable. Um, so I thought, wow, is there any bargaining power? If you are the little person and you are looking to sign some kind of type of contract with somebody like Adidas or you know a, a big company like that, multinational company, do you have any rights? How can you really protect yourself against this big fist? So do celebrities have the power to refuse the inclusion of morality clauses or to push back the language when signing a commercial endorsing endorsement agreement or venturing into a brand licensing deal with a large company. I said, uh, fortunately for well-known artists such as Ye West, the bargaining power is growing stronger. People are recognizing that possibly this was lopsided. Ye can utilize his ability to influence the media and societal fashion trends, as well as his capability of bringing a tremendous amount of profits for Adidas to leverage. So things are happening on both sides, but um, his lawyers still seem to have worked out this morality clause. I have to wonder within this clause, were there any rights? Um, but so since I couldn't see it, I had to get my brain, you know, thinking what could he have done? Um, and that made me think of one of my favorite songs. <laughs> little laugh. Um, no, it makes me think of Rocky because in Rocky, it's the little guy that has to go against the big guy. You know what I'm saying? Okay. All righty. 
Is it going to start over? Why do you just always do this? Okay. Um, but there is something called coercion in contracts. And it's when the big guy beats up on the little guy. I guess it could be a big woman beating up on a little woman. But usually women don't do that. Um, no, but for a contract to be valid, the contract must meet certain requirements. So I think not all morality clauses are going to work because you have to have mutual assent and consideration. If you are actually getting um, something from me, which is me saying that if I do anything of ill moral turpitude, then I this contract can just be voided, then you have to be paying me a lot of money to do that. So there has to be some balance. Consideration is part of that balance is what do I get for signing something that is maybe looking so lopsided. Morality clauses can be aggressively broad though. We've seen them, hi there. We've seen them very, very broad and they can be lacking in consideration. And for that reason, a court may determine that they will not hold up. But for the most part, they have been holding up um, clauses and contracts also should be and must be definite. I looked at the restatement of second, the second restatement of contracts, and it said um, that it requires that the terms be reasonably certain. So you saw earlier where the court was saying we can look it up, but we can't look up things that are so vague that we have no idea what they're saying. So it must be reasonably certain. When contractual language is ambiguous, it will normally be interpreted in favor of the non-drafting party. So it could be that that's one of the things that the court will say in this contract. Hey, you know, I look at it and it's so amb ambiguous, but of course I don't know what it says. But you could think of any other any any other contract that you or someone that you know or even some celebrity some celebrity could get into just with lawyers trying to go overboard and and cover everything that could be said or done in in social media for sure in social media now because anything can be said or done um, they could wind up drafting language that's overbroad or ambiguous. Um, but I you know I thought as if I was Yee's counsel your counsel. Um, he could have narrowed the scope and negotiated more favorable language that didn't say like bad behavior, like he literally would have had to prove that he was being anti-Semitic or something like that. I mean, I think the statement that he made, he made eh, pretty much killed it. Wah, wah, wah. But let's say it wasn't as strong as it came out. Um, then he could he could have maybe had some language that covered him on it, um, or he could have demanded the right to terminate the contract, but but has have to be paid what he had already um, earned up until that point. Now I kind of think that that's probably in there, but that's definitely something that I would have fought for for him. You can have a reverse morality clause. No, you point the finger at something that I do that's moral, but I can point it back at you and they can cancel themselves out because one hand kind of washes the other. You have to have clean hands in contract. And um, the, the last thing that I thought about is they could have opted for arbitration. Arbitration means that you don't go to trial normally. You don't go before a court of law that drags it out and winds up being so expensive. And in the media, you, you can have you know private um, ways to have dispute resolution. So I thought, and you can have a third party that's maybe not even a lawyer, but that is in the fashion industry who can speak to these situations and have real life experiences, which you know is a different way of practicing in law, but I think that um, it's a good way in business. So these arbitration clauses, if there's anything that I have said on, um, on these on, on these uh, Yeezy, Yeezy frenzies that, you know, bring something to mind with a contract that you or someone else has read or is in the midst of, I'd love to take a look at that for you. Um, you can also send any questions to me from the website. Here's the website information as well as the phone number. Feel free to give a call because we can give you some ideas about whether or not you should sign this contract. It may just be general at first, or it might be that we need to redraft the contract contract. Either way, we're here for you. We're the Evans International Law Firms where um, excellence matters and looking forward to serving you and your family. This is uh, the third episode of the Yeezy Frenzy. There will be two more. So look out for those. Thank you for listening.
Have a good evening.